Hi, I'm Dennis Cuevas, Director of the CLE Program at the DC Bar. On behalf of the Planning Committee, we hope you're enjoying the 2021 Judicial and Bar Conference. Welcome to this breakout session titled, So You Want to Be a Judge on the District of Columbia Courts. This public forum will provide information about the judicial application, nomination, and appointment process for the DC Courts, including the qualifications for judicial office. It will also include a question and answer session. While this session does not qualify for CLE credit, we are confident that you'll find it extremely helpful and informative. Good morning and welcome to So You Want to Be a Judge on the District of Columbia Courts. I'm Tracy Nuttall, Executive Director of the DC Judicial Nomination Commission. Joining me today are the Honorable Emmett G. Sullivan, U.S. District Court Judge for the District of Columbia, the Honorable Joshua Deal, Associate Judge on the District of Columbia Court of Appeals, the Honorable Kelly Higashi, Associate Judge on the Superior Court of the District of Columbia, and Addie Schmidt, Member and Vice Chair of the Litigation Department at Miller and Chevalier. For more information about the panelists, please see the speaker bios on the conference website. During this session, the panelists will share their insights on things you should consider if you are thinking about becoming a judge on the DC courts, tips and advice about what you can do now if you're considering engaging the judicial application process, and insights into the day-to-day -day experiences of judges on both courts. We will not discuss the magistrate judge application process. Also, we will not discuss in detail the JNC application process. We have included a handout with the session material called Joining the District of Columbia Court that outlines the eligibility requirements, the JNC recommendation process, and the nomination process. I encourage you to visit the JNC website at jnc.dc.gov for more information. Following the panel presentation, we will open the discussion for a brief Q&A period where we will go live and answer your questions. You are also invited to place your questions in the chat box throughout the presentation. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible. Panelists, let's get started. What should I or someone in our audience do now if I'm thinking about becoming a judge on the DC court? You can answer. I'll, I'll jump in. I mean, it, it depends on what stage of thinking you are. Uh, if you're ready to apply now, that's one thing. But, you know, say you're a law student or you're just beginning your legal practice. Um, a few practical things you can do are one, you know, show an interest in serving your community by doing work in your community. Um, another very simple thing you can do is remember that you're living in D.C. where everybody has political connections every which way. And, you know, when I got nominated, one of the most helpful people uh, in seeing me through to confirmation was the parent of a kid in my daughter's preschool class who just happened to be in the White House Counsel's office. And being decent to the people around you will pay dividends. So, I mean, it helps to keep in the back of your mind that the legal world is very small, that in order to become a judge, you're going to need some friends and connections and also, you're going to go through background checks um, where you don't want to have people saying bad things about you. Um, so those are some simple things you can do, even if you're years away from thinking of actually applying. I always encourage uh, attorneys to print the application. I encourage law students uh, while they're in law school to print the application and store it in a folder and uh, add to the application. Um, events that have occurred in your life that you'll have to report or should be reported when you finally apply to become a judge. I also encourage anyone to talk to any newly appointed judge uh, on either the Superior Court or the DC Court of Appeals. And most of the new judges would be very receptive to sharing uh, their thoughts and experiences with you. Um, there is one retired judge, Judge Melvin Wright, who has given me the permission to always say that you can reach out to Judge Wright for uh, tips, 
and advice about the application process, about the do's and don'ts. Um, I call Judge Wright Mr. Superior Court because he was a person who came up uh, as a bailiff, as a courtroom clerk, um, as a law student, as a law clerk to a judge I uh, had to uh, admire, Judge Shuker, um, U.S. Attorney's Office, a private practitioner, and then a Superior Court judge. He's got a wealth of information. Uh, he has a Superior Court website address. Uh, he does sit as a senior status judge, and he has said, I can always use his names, uh, use his name very generously. So I encourage you to reach out to Judge Wright for any tips and advice. Anyone else want to share on what someone can do now? If you're thinking about it. Let me just add, me just add one, one, one additional point. Don't be, don't be tentative about reaching out to any of the commissioners. Um, and I say that for this reason, just last evening, uh, and a, a person who I, having cons looked at her resume, uh, considered to be an outstanding attorney, had a legitimate question about the application process. And she had been encouraged to, by one of my colleagues, to call me with a very legitimate, very interesting question about whether she actually fit within the qualifications. Uh, we talked for maybe 15 or 20 minutes or so. She was deeply appreciative. I was glad that she reached out. And uh, we talked again uh, this morning and I gave her my opinion uh, about her qualifications, the statutory qualifications. And I, it, was, it was very important for me to say that I have but one vote, but my opinion is that, and I gave her my opinion. Um, so don't, be, don't, don't have any reservations about reaching out to us. We always, I always encourage my colleagues to uh, encourage lawyers they know who are interested in the application process to give me a call or to give any of the other commissioners a call. I encourage the judges on Superior Court and DC Court of Appeals also to tell interested people to give me a call or anyone else. We'll be more than happy to share with you um, our views about whatever, if, if it's appropriate, our views about the questions you present to us. Can any, uh, any one of you share about um, how one would de demonstrate their commitment to the community, to their community? <clears throat> I think there are countless ways to be active in the community and to demonstrate a commitment. And I think the best way to do that is by doing the things that matter to you that you can feel genuine about in giving back. Um, I think whether it's, uh, you know, obviously lots of people are active in the bar and that's important, but I think being active beyond the legal community um, and being really being a part of the community and ensuring that you're giving back um, is, is critically important. Um, and there are so many ways to do it. I don't think that one way counts more than another. If it's, you know, if it's through your church, if it's through alumni associations, if it's, it, there are so many ways. Um, and I just encourage people to, to be active in the community in the way that feels the most genuine um, to them. Thank you. I, I do want to remind the audience that uh, the JNC recently posted um, three vacancies for uh, judges uh, Winston, Weisberg, and Cannon. Um, that uh, information can be found on our uh, the JNC website, um, and the application deadline is May 10th. So I encourage all of you who are watching to uh, take a look at the application for that. Um, so if there if there aren't any more responses, we'll we'll switch to um, what happens uh, to a discussion on what happens after uh, someone submits their application to the JNC. And as you all well know. Um, the District of Columbia uses a merit-based selection process that is overseen by the JNC to rec recommend applicants for judicial positions on the DC courts. Seven members serve as commissioners, both lawyers and non-lawyers. Uh, the president of the United States appoints um, one, one commissioner and Addie, you uh, were appointed by uh, the president. Uh, the mayor of DC appoints two persons. They currently those persons are uh, Bill Lucy and Benjamin Wilson. The DC Council appoints a, council, a commissioner. Uh, currently that, uh, that, that seat is held by Marie Johns. The chief judge of the US District Court appoints a commissioner. Judge Sullivan serves as the chair. And the DC Bar Board of Governors appoints two commissioners. 
and those seats are held by John McAvoy and Professor Deborah S. Epstein. Eddie, as a commissioner, you have seen a lot of qualified applicants over the years. When you look at an applicant and their materials, what are you trying to ascertain during your individual evaluation process? So many things. <laughs> um, you know, obviously the obvious things, um, does the person have the requisite experience? Um, very important, do they have the right temperament? Um, but I think beyond that, wanting to ensure that they really understand what this job is and that it's really the job that they want. Um, and that can be trickier than you think because a lot of people a lot of people envision that they know what judges do and what the job entails, um, but don't necessarily have a full perspective on the job. And, and maybe they think that they want the job because it's the next logical step or because they're looking for a, a career change. Um, and those can be legitimate reasons to be interested in the job, but but the job is, is so critically important to the community. Um, and I always want to make sure that the person really knows what they what this job means and really wants to do it and is going to put their all into it. Um, so those are some of the things um, that I think about. I also think about which background and what kind of perspective they'll bring to the court. Um, we do care a lot about having a lot of different kinds of perspectives and backgrounds and experiences on the court. And I think about what the person will contribute to the court and the community overall beyond the cases that they're presiding on in whatever particular division they happen to be assigned to. Well, how important is the interview? The interview is very important. I think if, if each one of us thinks about every job that they've ever gotten, um, you know, usually the interview is important. Uh, it's the chance to distinguish yourself. Everyone we talk to basically has very impressive credentials, amazing experience. And so the interview is our opportunity to, to really find out why the person wants this position and, and what they'll bring. Um, sometimes we can evaluate, you know, temperament in the interview, um, again, perspective, humility. Um, and so I, I think the interview, it's short. Um, it's its gonna be a short interview. I, I do wanna mention that most of the JNC members will also meet individually with new applicants. Um, not all, but but if you, once you've applied, I do encourage everyone to reach out to the individual commission members and see if they will meet. Um, and uh, so, so I would say that, you know, for tips for the interview, be prepared, um, be yourself. And um, yeah, it's important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can, can I just, can I just yeah, add sure. one point? Um, I think from my perspective only, um, I try to gauge uh, an applicant's sensitivity to presiding over cases involving pro se litigants. Um, a significant percentage of cases that, uh, are presented to the court every day are presented either by pro se plaintiffs or defended by pro se defendants. On any given day, there are thousands of individuals who enter the courthouse prior to pandemic in pursuit of justice. And it's very important to, to try to get a feel for how this applicant um, will be in a um, very good position to preside over pro se cases. It requires a lot of patience and understanding um, and and, and um, it's important from my perspective to try to get a feel for um, how that person would be equipped to preside over those types of cases. Um, the other thing that I try to get a feel for, I ask a lot of hypothetical. And I may ask a hypothetical along the lines of if it's a prosecutor with, ex with um, extensive criminal experience or a defense attorney with extensive criminal experience, I want to know how the person plans to get up to speed with respect to assignments in the family court or family division and the civil division. So I might say sometimes, what would I say to a naysayer who says this applicant does not have any experience in the family court or the civil arena? Uh, 
And, uh, you know, I, I expect um, an appropriate answer about how a person would get up to speed and be able to hit the ground running if he or she was assigned to a court that that person does not have any experience in. And as it turns out, and Judge Hugashi can probably verify this, as it turns out, if you've been in the criminal, if you have significant criminal experience, your first assignment will probably be in civil or family. I don't know if that's still true or not. That's Absolutely. The way, that's the way life is in superior court. So you better have a good well, answer about how you're going to address um, whatever dearth of experience you may have in a certain uh, area of the law. Judge Sullivan, along those lines, how much litigation experience is needed? Well, I mean, let's be realistic. Um, as I said a few minutes ago, thousands of people enter the Superior Court every day in pursuit of justice. It's the District of Columbia's Court of General Jurisdiction. It's an outstanding court. I loved every minute I worked there uh, for the uh, number of years that I worked there. So litigation experience is a plus. Now, to put that another way, if you don't have litigation experience, that does not disqualify you from being favorably considered. For instance, the statute provides that the Judicial Nomination Commission can forward to the president the names of, of professors of law who work in the, who teach in the uh, law schools in the District of Columbia. And it may well be that a professor who's actively engaged in teaching every day has less litigation experience than, than a practitioner who's in court every day. That's not always the case, but it's a plus, but it's not a disqualifier if you don't have litigation experience. So what are some of the common problems you see during the process? How much, how much time do I have? <laughs> Let, let, me, let, me, let me highlight the main problems that, that applicants should seriously consider. Um, and we see these, these are, the, these are the recurring issues that we see come up. You, you have to be a bona fide resident of the District of Columbia. You can't be a resident of DC for four days out of seven or the best five out of seven. You have to be a bona fide resident of DC. And if you have concerns about whether you're a bona fide resident, you need to look at some tax cases or some domicile uh, or some cases that presented domicile issues to determine if you are indeed a bona fide resident. The simple answer is just move into DC, get a driver's license, start paying taxes, and you don't have to worry about whether you are a bona fide resident of DC. That's a simple answer. The statute and the rules provide that no later than 90 days prior to the, to the Judicial Nomination Commission submitting names to the president, the person it must be a bona fide resident. And you can't, it's impossible to game that. You can't game the system. You don't know when we're gonna send names up. And so why play games? Just uh, you know, move into the District of Columbia and become a, a tax paying resident and citizen and, uh, and, and give back generously to your, to your city in the form of pro bono services. That's a recurring issue. Another issue that we see a lot of times is um, the tax issue, I call it. If, if you have, if you're behind in your taxes or if IRS is hounding you for not filing tax returns, or if you have a payment plan with either the federal government or the District of Columbia government, put those issues behind you first before you apply. Um, the, the commission oftentimes puts itself in a position of, of, of considering if we send applicant A to the White House, will the president seriously consider this person who has a payment plan with the government or outstanding tax issues with the government? And the answer more often than not is a resounding no. So if you have those issues, there's nothing wrong with having a payment plan with the government to pay back tax. There's nothing illegal about that. But the problem is, will the president seriously consider you? I mean, we don't reach out to the White House and ask them, in advance, we consider this person who owes $100,000 in back taxes. You know, the answer is pretty clear. The person probably will not be considered. So get those issues behind you. If there are bar complaints pending against an individual, get them resolved before you file an application. Sometimes a partner in a law firm is a defendant in a bar case, knows nothing about a case, but because he or she is a partner in a law firm, 
the net is thrown wide with respect to a bar complaint. And, you know, that person has to seek some sort of resolution or the firm has to seek some sort of resolution. If you're engaged in uh, litigation in the courts and there's no such thing as a friendly divorce case, even if it's uncontested. If you're engaged in litigation, put the litigation behind you before you file an application. Um, one thing that comes up a lot uh, is, is a question about uh, the writing samples that um, an applicant will, will submit. Don't, don't submit a, you know, the, 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 uh, the carbon copy motion to continue a trial date or motion for more time. We need to be able to assess your analytic and writing ability. Um, and, and too often the examples show someone had to address a fairly mundane issue or was confined to um, a, a, a long iteration of detail. So, so be very careful about your writing submission. We do read everything. And on the topic of reading, I always tell applicants, have someone who loves you proofread your application materials before you submit them. Spell check is not going to find all the errors. And you're really shooting yourself in the foot if you don't read everything yourself word for word, because we do, and have that person who loves you read everything in your application materials word for word and provide you with an objective critique about the substance and the style. If, you, if your materials are fraught with typos, uh, grammatical errors, and other errors, your application is not going anywhere. Keep in mind, these are positions that require attention to detail. And if you don't provide attention to detail to your own application materials, why in the world would we think that you provide greater detail to a serious legal nature presented to you by a pro se litigant? Those are my suggestions. Addie, did you want to add anything or did the judge miss anything? He never misses anything. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. Thank you so much. That, that was great information, Judge Sullivan, uh, that you, you shared with our audience. And, and Addie, appreciate your comments as well. So let's switch up a little bit. We want to talk to our uh, sitting judges right now uh, on the DC courts. And we want to know what happens uh, after uh, someone goes through the process. So um, can you all share Judge Deal and Judge Higashi uh, an insight about what happens after you have gone through this process that uh, Judge Sullivan and Addie shared? Sure, uh, I'll start. So if you get through the JNC, that means you've made a list of three, three names that are sent to the White House for potential nomination. Uh, what happens after that, there's really two big buckets that happen after that. One is the White House and one is the Senate. Um, we'll just bracket the Senate for now. That means you've been nominated and if you get there, you should call some of us for advice and we can walk you through that. Uh, the short answer on the Senate is if you're Judge Higashi, they send a limo to pick you up, they roll out a red carpet and then they confirm you the next day and throw a ticker tape parade. And if you're me, uh, they make you wait a couple of years before they grudgingly move you along. Um, but in the White House, which is the most immediate thing that's going to happen if you make a list of three, um, you're going to get a call pretty soon. In my case, I think it was about a week um, to come in for an interview about a week later. Um, so it moves fast. So if you feel like you're in the running and that you're a credible candidate to make a list of three, you probably want to game out what connections you might have in the White House Counsel's office um, to try to start getting some good words put in on your behalf. Um, some people submit a whole lot of letters. Um, I didn't do that, and I'm not sure how effective that is. Uh, I, I tried to do some direct outreach. Um, sorry, not direct. Um, that's bad advice. Don't do it yourself. I tried to do some indirect outreach. Uh, via people who I knew who knew the people in the White House Counsel's Office, um, including, you know, former people who I'd worked for and people who were friends with them. And then when you go interview at the White House, there will be, you know, it's nerve wracking. 
Um, you walk into the old executive office building, they put you through some security. Um, there is a substantive part of the interview. There is a background check part of the interview where they will ask you things that um, you should start thinking about before you go in there. Uh, if you have interesting things in your background, they're probably gonna come up. So after that, it's just a waiting game. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you this, on the waiting game, nobody knows what they're talking about. There are so many people who told me, look, they're gonna make a pick within a week or two weeks. And if you haven't heard back by then, you're out. And then a, like a month later, I figured I was dead in the water and I got a call on my phone from the White House saying I was the nominee and don't tell anybody, it'll be a couple weeks before we announce. Um, so every White House is a little bit different. And right now we're in a different White House than the one that I was nominated by. So they might take a week, they might take two, they might take three, they might take a month. Um, but it's really finicky. Uh, try not to, I mean, this is impossible advice to follow, but try not to stress out too much about it after the interview is done because it's out of your hands. Um, so that's, that's kind of the next steps. Uh, you both heard uh, Abby, Abby's perspective on the interview process. Can you all share how, your opinion on, on the interview and would you have be able to share some tips on the uh, preparing for the interview with the JNC or the interview even with the White House? I'm happy to talk about that. Um, and I guess in terms of interviews after the JNC part of the process, um, there is the White House interview and then um, if you get nominated, then there's another interview that you have before your confirmation hearing. And uh, I think they call it a staff interview. And for me, that was an interview with about a dozen or maybe slightly more staffers for the senators who were um, going to be conducting my confirmation hearing. Um, one general thing I'd say about both of those interviews is um, it is a, um, definitely a contrast with the interview experience with the JNC. I would definitely say keep in mind that the JNC consists of commissioners who are steeped in the details of what it is like to be a superior court judge or a DC court of appeals judge. They are experts. I have to say, I was incredibly impressed by their level of familiarity and commitment. In every one of the JNC interviews I had, the person I was speaking to had my application. It was highlighted, it was tabbed. They just, they are um, steeped, like I said, in the details of what the job is about. They know what they are looking for. Keep in mind, that an interview at the White House or um, with the Senate, it's very different. Those people are generalists. They do not solely vet people who are applying to the DC courts. And so they have much less familiarity. Their questions tend to be much more general. And so you wanna make sure that you're prepared to answer general questions, but also maybe educate them about, connect how, what they're asking you about either relates or maybe doesn't really relate directly to the job that you're applying for, that you want to do. So it's a kind of much different experience. Um, one, uh, I guess very specific little tidbit I'll share is that everyone I spoke to before I had my White House interview told me, okay, be prepared. They're probably gonna ask you, what Supreme Court justice do you admire most and why? And I will tell you, I think that that is just an absolute mandatory question they ask everybody. I have never spoken to one person who had a White House interview who was not asked that question. Um, but I would say, I think the most important thing is just keep in mind the different perspectives that those two groups of people have compared with the JNC. Great, great. So how did, how did you decide when was the right time for you to apply? Well, um, let me say this. I get 
a question about whether or not, you know, the question, I, I talk to a lot of people who are thinking about applying. And the people who I get who ask me, you know, am I qualified or not, tend not to be the white men in the group who tend to just assume that they're qualified to be a judge. Um, so my advice to everybody is if you think you're ready, if you've been in the courts and if you've shown a commitment to the DC community and you think you can do it, don't worry so much about whether or not your qualifications are up to snuff. Let Judge Sullivan and Addy do that. They're not gonna send you up if your qualifications aren't good enough. Don't take yourself out of the running because you're not so sure you are as good as the last person who went up. If that's the way everybody acts, you're just gonna get a judiciary full of arrogant people and nobody with an ounce of modesty is gonna end up on the bench. Um, so I try to encourage people to go easy on themselves when it comes to, do I have all the qualifications? You know, I see these last few judges had X, Y, and Z, and I don't have that. Don't worry about it. Um, throw your hat in the ring if, if you think you're ready. Now, personally, how did I decide that it was my time? Well, I was encouraged. So I worked for four different judges before I became, before I became a judge. Um, two of them were, I think Justice Kennedy was 38 when he was on the Ninth Circuit. Judge Benavidez was 33, I think, when he became a judge in the Texas court system. Um, so they were on the young side when they did it. And I was on the young side when I applied. And they were both very encouraging. Um, I think Judge Sullivan, what were you, 36 when you ended up on the Superior Court? Yes. Um, so, <laughs> you know, it... I had some hesitation because I was slightly mm -hmm. on the younger side, but seeing, you know, remarkable judges throughout the judiciary who started when they were young, you know, it got me over that hesitation. And having worked as a clerk and as an extern for judges, uh, I knew it was a job that I liked. It was, I knew it was a job that I found fulfilling. And I sort of thought, you know, for every time I've gotten an opinion back and thought, you know, this judge just totally got it wrong. I thought I don't get to complain if I'm not throwing my own hat in the ring and I'm not trying to contribute and make things better. Um, so that was my thought process. It, I would say that I uh, probably was on the other end of the spectrum from Josh when I applied. Um, it wasn't just the, do I feel ready for it? Although I, I do wanna say, um, I, I think Josh makes a great point and it is important if you are seriously considering this um, as something you wanna to do to talk to people. Um, I was asked a lot when I finally started sharing with people, okay, I, I think now it's the time I'm really gonna apply. Um, so many people ask me like, what took you so long? And one of the first things that I would always tell people is um, my first inspiration um, for becoming a judge was the judge I clerked for on the Superior Court, Judge Frederick Weisberg, who is pretty legendary. <laughs> and um, I think that it was difficult for me because he is uh, such a great example of just everything you'd want a judge to be that, you know, I constantly, when I would think about it, I think well, there, there's just no way I am even close to being half the judge that um, he was. And, and so I had to kind of um, eventually like put that aside because I realized I, I'm never gonna apply um, if that's my standard. But the other thing um, to think about is also, um, while that being a judge was the, just the kind of ideal ultimate dream job for me, I also was in a job that I loved that I was so dedicated to, and not just the day-to-day case-by-case, -case, but there was an overall cause that I was committed to with my job. Um, and so um, for me, that was kind of the main thing. I, I, being chief of the sex offense and domestic violence section at the US Attorney's Office, I really felt part of a, a cause, there's a greater um, effort to want to um, elevate especially with sexual assaults, sexual assaults against children, to elevate among the public the kind of awareness about um, 
what is a real kind of hidden um, and very um, not very much talked about crime. And so I knew that I also needed to apply at a time when I felt ready to leave that and take what would be the last job I would have as a lawyer. So that's kind of another, um, that was another aspect to that thinking for me. So Thank you. even though it seemed kind of like, oh, uh, why didn't you, why didn't you apply before um, for a lot of people? I, I felt like when I did, I did apply, it was the right time. Thank you. Can you all briefly share uh, what, if anything, has surprised you about the job? Oh, if there were any surprises? <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I can tell you. Um, okay, so as the judge, you are the one person in the room or involved in the case with the greatest amount of responsibility for making decisions that will affect the ultimate outcome of the case. Yet also, as the judge, you are the one person with the least knowledge about the facts and the people involved in the case. And for me, that was a huge shift from being a prosecutor, where my job was to investigate, investigate, investigate. And in every case, I, I interviewed many more people than the judge or the jury would ever hear from. Um, so that was, that was a big shift. <laughs> yeah, I, I think a very similar uh, response for me is in terms of biggest surprise, which is, you know, it's a little bit different on the Court of Appeals, but at the end of the day, uh, nothing can prepare you for the crush of work uh, being a DC Court of Appeals judge. You know, the amount of stuff that we put out that's public, you know, the published opinions, if that was all there was, there'd still be a lot of work to do. But really, I get to spend maybe 25 to 30 percent of my time writing those opinions. And the rest is on committee work and administrative side things and unpublished opinions and motions. Uh, it is a lot. Um, and so uh, it, it is a tough job for people who are perfectionists at heart, which tends to be an attribute of people who get into appellate work. Uh, and it's one that's impossible to keep with you uh, if you want to stay on top uh, of the work that we have. I mean, you, got, you have to do the best you can um, in the time that you've got. And it's, you know, it, it, it's a challenge, but it's, it's a manageable one. One little thing I'll add. This is a completely different little surprise. Uh, as Judge Sullivan mentioned, um, if even if you have, or especially if you have a long career in a particular area of law, your first assignment as a superior court judge is likely to be in a division that is completely different. And that is what I'm experiencing. I was a criminal prosecutor for 24 years and my first assignment has been in the civil division. And so there has understandably been a very steep learning curve for me to become comfortable with civil litigation. But I have to say there have been some nice little surprises um, here and there um, where I find unexpectedly that my skills as a prosecutor have been transferable <laughs> to civil litigation. An example is um, mediation. So um, I was not, uh, so I have to say, I think I had very, with little to no training, I walked into my first mediation, um, probably my second week on the bench. Um, it's part of a settlement conference in every civil two case. And uh, I kind of really didn't know what to expect and, and, and how I should run this thing. Um, and uh, despite that lack of formal training and experience, I, I settled the case. And I think that um, I found that, uh, maybe it settled despite me, but <laughs> um, no, I, I did find, um, and it was a nice surprise to find that my experience interviewing victims um, and my experience interviewing victims, even though it was in criminal cases, was really transferable to um, being able to talk to and make a connection with litigants in a civil case and to try and help them in the individual um, part of the mediation when I'm speaking to one side and not the other 
to help them be able to think about and articulate what is most important to them. What, what hurt them the most in this dispute? And what is most important to them to get out of a settlement in this case? And, and that part just came natural to, naturally to me. And um, it, was, it was a really nice feeling. It was unexpected and it, and it was nice to see. Some skills are transferable. Thank you both for sharing your insights on what happens or what, what could happen after you're appointed to the court. And so as we, as we are close to the end of our time, I have a final question for each of you in, in about 60 seconds or less. What is the most important piece of advice you would share with a prospective applicant? Judge Sullivan. 60 seconds, I'll talk fast. First, I agree with Josh, do not self-select yourself out of the process. People do that. It's, we consider everything you bring to the table, all of your experiences in life and in law. Um, the other advice I would give you is be careful of social media. Whatever you, out, whatever you have out there on social media, clean it up. Stay off of social media. I wouldn't know how to get on Twitter and don't ever want to know how to get on Twitter. Um, Lincoln was correct. Your reputation is your stock and trade. And the chickens will come home to roost if you apply for a judgeship. Judges will call you. They, they will call me. They will write letters and say, this person is always doing this, that, and the other in front of me. Um, your opposing counsel can either sink your ship or keep you afloat. Be very, very careful how you treat people. Um, I'm, ex I'm, I'm especially interested in what defense attorneys think about prosecutors applying and what prosecutors think about defense attorneys who apply for judgeships. I put a lot of weight on those opinions. A 60 second. Yeah, so that's, I'll echo that first before jumping on my own, which is, you know, the, your reputation stays with you. Uh, everybody from law school on, uh, you don't want to have enemies if you want to have this job. Um, the other thing I would say that doesn't come naturally for so many people is get comfortable asking for help. Um, when you're applying to be a judge, it helps to have people speak well of you, write letters for you to the JNC, make calls to the White House for you. And it's uncomfortable making those requests, say, asking somebody, is it, you know, could you write this letter for me? And what you'll find when you do it, probably, is that most people are jumping out of their chairs to help you. Um, and, and it feels, it's an uncomfortable request, but once you get used to it, uh, and it becomes sort of like second nature, you realize that there are a lot of people out there that wanna help you. And so you shouldn't deprive yourself of that because you're a little timid about admitting that you wanna be a judge, about asking for help. Um, so get in front of it and ask people for help and do so unabashedly because I think you'll find that they're going to be willing to help. Uh, I agree with everything they said. So I wanna add something a little different. When you go through the process of asking people who have been through the process for advice. Um, some people may give you the advice that you must do A, B, and C. You must do X, Y, Z. Um, and my piece of advice is um, seek advice from people about the process, but uh, be yourself. And in the end, do what is comfortable for you. You, you have to be yourself always, and you have to um, just do what you feel is in line with yourself, your personality, and the way you want to um, project yourself. And Addie, your closing thoughts. Thanks, Tracy. Um, obviously, everything everyone has said, all of these judges are very wise, um, so I agree with all of their advice. I think um, really do your homework. You know, your lawyers, if you're watching this presentation, if you're thinking about being a judge, you're a lawyer. So you're used to gathering information, you're used to being prepared, um, you're used to finding out the facts. That applies to this process as much as it applies to anything else. Um, get, seek feedback at every stage, um, but also just excel at what you're doing. Be, do the best job that you can do, whatever you're doing right now, and be active in your community and give give to that. And that will come back when you're ready to apply to the process, when you're ready to get this feedback, when you're ready to ask letters, those people will be there because you will have done a really good job and you will be genuine and you will be deserving of support. Um, so I would say, you know, 
focus on what you're doing and do a really good job wherever you are. Um, and when you're ready, you'll know, or someone will tell you that you're ready. If you're, if you're self-selecting out, hopefully you have someone in your corner who's gonna tell you it's time. Thank you all so much for sharing uh, this morning. And we will now take a few questions from our audience. Beth Sullivan, we have a question that was asked in the chat box. <clears throat> wouldn't an individual who has serious credit history, um, wouldn't that person uh, be considered a poor candidate for a judicial position? That's, that's an overly broad question. I'd, I'd have to know more information. Uh, I mean, for instance, if the person is participating in a wage earners plan uh, or is in the midst of a bankruptcy proceeding, uh, it's probably highly doubtful that the um, commission would, would forward that person's uh, name to, um, the, uh, to the White House. Um, on the other hand, uh, had that person been, say, in bankruptcy, bankruptcy 20 years ago, um, and uh, credit rating is high, then, then um, I, I see no reason why that person could not be considered on the merits. But I'd have to know more. Uh, the, the, the question is already brought. I'd have to know more uh, to be able to give you a better answer. Thank you, Judge Sullivan. Judge Higashi and Deal, we, we talked a little bit about um, what your experience would be when you transition to the court. Can you share with us a little bit about the training you received when you uh, became judges on the court, both the Court of Appeals and the Superior Court? Judge Higashi, she started with you. Sure, sure thanks. Um, so from the day I started, I had four weeks of training before I took the bench. And I think that's pretty standard. Two weeks, uh, the first two weeks are uh, training on just basically how to be a judge, <laughs> the generic aspects of it. And it's uh, basically a series of in-depth sessions with um, judges and um, other people that you need to hear from, like bar counsel, um, but, uh, I think on my very first day, I met with two associate judges from the DC Court of Appeals. <laughs> um, and uh, so it's a wide variety of topics, Ten judi judicial ethics, um, but there's two weeks of that. And then you have two weeks of substantive training um, on the area of law that's involved in your first assignment. So my first assignment was to the civil division. And so I, I had a very intensive two weeks of training with various judges who um, were currently in the civil division. And then there's also this um, famed uh, moot court session. So it's a, a session on evidence that basically you spend your four weeks of training trying to prepare for and uh, then you do a moot court session and there are some judges um, on our court who are kind of known for being evidence experts who teach evidence judge lee judge fisher judge morin and um, so you also do get some chance to um, kind of do a a moot type of training but it's it's four weeks of intensive training and it doesn't end there of course once you take the bench you are still um you know kind of responsible for availing yourself of the numerous resources to continue learning judge deal did you have anything to add uh, yeah, it's a little bit different on the Court of Appeals, but so not so different. Um, there are really, I would say, two buckets that the training falls into. The, the first bucket is sort of all the non-substantive things um, that come along with being a judge. Um, and I think we had trainings for about two or three weeks um, learning those. And that's, that's everything from uh, security training, what to do if you get a threat, 
um, how to get into various parts of the courthouse. Uh, and there is a you know meeting with disciplinary council, meeting with uh, the DC bar side of things. Um, there is a lot of unseen work that happens at the courts um, that requires some training. They had put together a tremendous program of a few weeks of meetings uh, to provide that training. The other bucket is really the substantive training, how to go about deciding cases, writing opinions. That is something that you're most, it's, it's trial by fire. Um, you have colleagues who you can ask for advice. They will share for manuals and things of that nature to make sure you're checking all the boxes with the opinions that you're doing. But otherwise, you're in the deep end uh, real fast. And in my case, I was mostly thrown into the deep end at the start of a pandemic. So it was particularly interesting uh, learning. You know, I think I was in the courtroom three or four times before everything moved to virtual. Um, but otherwise, I've been virtual both in terms of sittings and with my clerks since then. So it's been uh, a steep learning curve. Um, there is some training, but a lot of it is uh, learning to swim after you're thrown into the pool. Thank you. So I want to go back a little bit to, to a question that was asked in the chat, uh, something around, um, are there qualities and experience profiles currently missing on the bench that would be beneficial to either the Superior Court or the Court of Appeals? And maybe Judge Sullivan, you want to answer that? And sure. You might want to answer. Sure, uh, I'd be happy to. Uh, it, I tell you, it's very frustrating um, that uh, there has not been a family law practitioner who's applied for a judgeship in many years. And we have tried everything we possibly can try to encourage family law practitioners to apply and be considered. Um, but uh, up to date, um, family law practitioners have not applied. It's also very frustrating that civil rights attorneys have not applied. There's one judge on the Superior Court uh, who um, was an outstanding lawyer at the Legal Aid Agency. Um, but since that judge was appointed a few years ago, there have not been any um, applicants from the Legal Aid Agency or the Neighborhood Legal Service Program, my former employer after law school. And uh, it's not because we haven't tried to encourage people to apply. Those are two categories. I mean, we, we get a ton of applicants from um, the Public Defender Service, the U.S. Attorney's Office, uh, but diversity of experience is very important because, as we've said time and time and time again, uh, the courts are indeed a microcosm of the community that it serves. And it's very important that uh, the judges on the court uh, represent the very um, significant diversity in the Washington, D.C. area. I see a, a couple of other um, areas. I, I certainly agree with Judge Sullivan. A couple of other areas I would add. Um, immigration law. I don't think we have um, a, a significant number of judges who practice in the area of immigration and who represent um, represented in, in private practice or in, in their prior um, careers uh, immigrants. And I, and I think that that would be helpful to have more of. Um, and, and I also think that we could use more um, judges with private practice, particularly potentially um, big firms, just because, you know, as Judge Sullivan said, it's, it's beneficial to the court and the community to have a wide variety of backgrounds and, and those are a couple of areas that I think are not particularly well represented currently. Thank you. So here's another question that um, has been presented in the chat box. How might the legal community participate in the judicial nomination process if they are not members of the JNC? In other words, what role do lawyers play in the judicial nomination process? Well, lawyers have, lawyers have loud voices. We want to hear from the lawyers. We want to hear their opinions about the applicants. And now we have made the application process as transparent as we possibly can. And if there's something else we should be doing, please let us know. We provide survey forms online. All a person has to do is go into the, to the Judicial Nomination Commission website, 
and print out a survey form and give us your opinion about an applicant. So we treasure those opinions because we want to hear from opposing counsel when appropriate. We want to hear from co-counsel. We want to hear from judges. So the lawyer's role, the judge's role is extremely important in informing us about the uh, competence and abilities and reputation of the applicant. I think one other potential area, I'm sorry, Judge Jones, were you starting to answer? Not. Uh, maybe one other area um, is, is helping recruit. <laughs> I mean, if, you know, if you're out there and you're practicing with colleagues or you, you know, know people who have the right background and, and temperament and experience, and you think that they would be uh, a, a strong candidate, encouraging them to apply. <clears throat> Especially yeah. after learning about, you know, some people count themselves out, um, and so it, it's often helpful for people to hear from their peers um, that that this is something they should consider. So, are there any any something that keeps that has come up a little bit is the residency requirement and how um, the residence residency requirement perhaps. Uh, being an impediment to to individuals, special legal, legal service providers applying um, to the applying for judicial vacancy. It, of course, that requires uh, congressional action. But but can either of you sort of share why the residency requirement is, is important? Um, give a little bit of conversation of, around the residency requirement. Yeah, I'm very sensitive about that. I'm proud to be a native Washingtonian and to have lived in the District of Columbia. Uh, for my entire life, with the exception of a month or two after law school. Um, I firmly believe that uh, judges should live in the community in which they're administering justice. And, and they, it, it should not be a process where judges drive into D.C. every day, administer their brand of justice, and, and head for the hills every evening. So um, I uh, would hope that uh, Congress would never take any steps to eliminate that important aspect of home rule. Home rule is very limited um, now for the District of Columbia residents, but we're proud of the fact that judges need to be bona fide residents of the District of Columbia, pay taxes in D.C., have D.C. driver's licenses, and be subject to the brand of justice that they're administering. So I hope the day never comes when Congress anticipates, when, when Congress attempts to eradicate that very important requirement for judges. So are there any final thoughts that either of you would like to share about the process, um, about your experience um, that would be, you think uh, you missed or would be helpful to the audience? Don't everyone I'd rather let wanted. Judge Sullivan speak because his, his, his opinions here are the most valuable. So. No, no, they're not. They're not. But, you know, it's, it's another frustrating aspect of this process is that people tend to self-select themselves um, out of the judicial selection process, um, and, and especially minorities and women. And I know that because I've spoken with them. Um, and, and sometimes it takes gentle encouraging from judges and lawyers to encourage a friend or colleague to apply. More often than not, you're gonna get a response from that potential applicant. Well, you know, maybe I need some more seasoning. I hate that word seasoning, you know, but we're talking about barbecuing and grilling, it's appropriate. But by and large, uh, we consider um, everything that a person brings to the table. And, and I think there are too many potential applicants out there who wait too long to, um, to apply, um, and, and I just encourage people not to select themselves out of that process. Uh, if you have questions about uh, whether or not you would be a good uh, applicant for consideration, any of us uh, would be happy to discuss very informally with you your qualifications, your experience. Some people say I've not had a lot of trial experience, or maybe I've had no trial experience. And, and, and that's something we would consider 
because we're talking about two courts of general jurisdiction. But it's not a disqualifier if you've never tried a case. Is it a plus? If you've tried cases, of course it is. But maybe you have other skills and other areas that would persuade the Judicial Nomination Commission to um, favorably consider your application and uh, advance your name to the White House. So don't select yourself out. Yeah, I, I agree with that 100%. And the only thing I'll add is you have a lot of resources available to you if you're thinking about becoming a judge. If you're here listening to this panel, you already know that. Uh, but I don't think I've ever been contacted by somebody who was thinking about applying um, or had applied to a superior court or a court of appeals vacancy, but I didn't take some time out of my day to talk to you. And I think the same thing would be true of the other judges on this court, and the judges over in the superior court, uh, and I suspect on the JNC as well. So there are, you know, don't try to navigate this in the dark. There are a lot of people um, who have a vested interest in getting the best applicants we can and who want to take the time out to encourage the people and help them navigate the process of becoming a judge in D.C. So, you know, don't hesitate to reach out if you find yourself in that position. You're on mute, Judge <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I echo that. I, I send out an open invitation to anyone who um, wants to reach out. There, I've had a lot of people, people who I don't know very well, people I've met once or people that other people say, hey, you know, a friend of mine would like to talk to someone who uh, is a new judge to talk about what it's like transitioning or even just to, what the whole process was like. It can be kind of mysterious, um, but I'm like Judge Deal said, I have never said no to anybody who um, asked if I could spend some time uh, talking about the process and my experience and, and a job that I love. As our time draws nigh, I want to remind you all in the audience that we do have a vacancy that's opening. That's the Winston uh, White Serving Cannon vacancy, which closes at 12 noon on Monday, May the 10th. We encourage you all to look at the application, visit our website um, at jnc.dc.gov, um, jnc um, to get more information about um, those vacancies. And if there are no parting uh, comments, again, I want to thank you all, Judges Sullivan, Deal, and Scotty, and Addie for uh, participating in this panel. And I want to thank you, the audience, for viewing and for your thoughtful questions. Can I just add one thing to what Tracy said? Uh, Tracy just said it's very important that you not wait until the last day to file your application materials. Things happen, systems crash, and you know we're we're very um, uh, sincere when we say that application materials that are incomplete or that are filed after the 12 noon deadline will not be considered. So get your applications in well in advance of May the 10th. I mean, we're lawyers by training and judges and lawyers tend to procrastinate, but this is, an, a very, a, this is a very important event in your life. And you don't want to um, miss the deadline or attempt to file in your system at home when your internet crashes and you're not, unable to do so. So don't wait till the last day. Right, and, and for that, it also doesn't allow us in the office to get back to you if something is missing. So we're happy to do that. We have done it in the past, but only if we have a sufficient amount of time to reach out to you and say, get this in by, by the deadline. Can you expand on that, Tracy? When you say something's missing, something missing like what? In other words, let's say someone didn't didn't upload a form or something, or they thought they uploaded a form, or the form was uplo uploaded and it wasn't signed. Well, as we're checking in the documents, we're able to, to go through our checklist and say, hey, this document, you didn't sign it, or you, you missed one form, and, and, and they're able to get it in in time by the deadline. But after the deadline, then your, your application is incomplete, and so it will not be considered. 